Welcome to this recording. We're going to be focusing on enhancing your SBR question practice by effectively debriefing and self-marking your own answers. My name is Claire Dean and I'm an expert ACA tutor and today I'm going to be guiding you through this presentation. We'll be using the self-marking tool that exists on the ACA practice platform and using this tool will allow you to get the most out of your question practice which in turn will allow you to identify how to improve your mark. This session will take you through the process of marking some of the most common requirements found in the SBR exam. Now I've prepared answers to a selection of requirements from two recent SBR exams, and we're gonna use the self-marking tool to mark my answers. And that will give you the confidence to repeat this exercise on your own practice questions. Many students ask me why they got a certain mark in a mock exam or a practice question. They thought they'd done well. They'd spent the allocated time. I wrote lots is what I hear. And they are quite rightly disappointed when they don't get the mark they felt they deserved. Perhaps that's how you feel. Are you baffled as to how your answers are marked? Do you have large paragraphs in marked questions where you scored no or maybe low marks? What exactly is the difference between a half mark point and a one mark point? Well, sometimes it's hard to know what the examiner is looking for, especially in those explain or discuss requirements. The exam is not marked by a computer or a robot, but by a human being. And having marked this paper for the ACA, I can tell you it, it isn't an easy job, especially where students have illegible handwriting in a paper-based exam or tightly packed, poorly laid out answers on a computer-based exam, or where two requirements have been rolled together and answered as one. By going through the exercise of marking your own questions, you can really humanize the marker, put yourself in their shoes. Remember, the examiner wants you to pass, but you have to give them every opportunity of awarding you marks, making your answers easy to mark. Looking at your own answers, against the examiner's answer can really help you to identify what you need to do to score well. By self-marking, you'll be better able to understand where and why you're losing marks. And from there, you can work on fine tuning your answers to ensure you succeed. You wanna hit the requirements with your responses, have an answer that's well laid out, clear to follow, easy to mark. One final tip before we get started. When you do come to mark your answers, it's a good idea to wait a day or at least a few hours after attempting the question. Sometimes there's a disconnect between what's in your head and how it appears on paper. And by reading your answers with fresh eyes, it allows you to be much more objective in the marking process. And remember, if you can't follow your own answer, and for those of you doing on paper, you can't read your own writing, then what hope will the marker have? As you know, the SBR syllabus is very broad, but there are three common requirements found in virtually every exam. And I'm gonna use these to structure this session. Firstly, there's a requirement to prepare a calculation. This could be a defined benefit pension calculation or determining goodwill arising on an acquisition. Here, the focus is on the mechanics of the calculation. You might also be asked to produce the relevant extracts from the financial statements, incorporating the numbers you've calculated. Next, there's the discuss or explain the accounting for a scenario type question that features in every exam. This typically requires a blend of calculation together with explanations to support your conclusions. There can be several of these blended calculation and discuss requirements in one exam. Finally, I'll look at the student's least favorite question style, pure discussion questions. These could relate to a current issue. For example, why has a particular standard been issued? Or discuss the challenges in applying that standard. Or it could relate to topical issues. Let's start with the first question type, where you're asked to prepare a calculation. Now, when you are asked for calculations, do make sure you read the question really carefully. You want to see if it's only a calculation that's required 
or whether you need to support your calculation with an explanation. Be so careful to only include an explanation if specifically requested. Otherwise, you'll be wasting valuable time and earning no marks. Also check whether extracts in the financial statements are required. The examiner expects you to prepare your calculations on the spreadsheet, so make sure you use the functionality of the spreadsheet. This means don't add up numbers on your calculator and then type the answer back into the spreadsheet because that's where errors creep in. For those of you sitting a paper-based exam, the examiner is happy for you to put your calculations into the main body of your answer or at the end in an appendix. Whatever you do, it's important that your workings are marker friendly. That means clearly labeled, have a heading for each working. Easy to follow, don't just provide a series of numbers added together, but use some text to support your numbers because that ensures that if you have made a mistake, the marker will be able to follow that mistake through under the own figure rule and will be able to award you marks for consistency. And think about the best way to structure your working. Tables are really useful, particularly for things like a foreign currency question. You can show the foreign currency amount, the exchange rate, and the translated number in separate columns. Once complete, don't leave your answer lurking in that working. Transfer the number back to your Word document, making sure you cross-reference through. It's perfectly acceptable to use abbreviations in your workings. For example, PP&E or PL or SFP. This will help save precious minutes across the exam. Let's now see these points in practice by marking an answer that I've prepared for a question of this style. We're in the ACA practice platform and we're looking at a question called Car Beast, which was question one from the March, June 2019 exam. I've already pre-populated an answer. Here it is on the right hand side. And we're going to access the marking section of the platform. And we're going to take a look at requirement A2 from this question. Now we've been asked to calculate goodwill on the acquisition of a subsidiary called Bike Light and to find out what that balance would then be at the 30th of September, immediately before the shares are sold. Your answer should also include a calculation of the exchange difference on the goodwill for the period from the 1st of January 20X6 to September X6. And in total, it's worth five marks. Underneath, I've got the exhibit that relates to this particular requirement. So you have all the information there. And what I would like you to do is to pause the recording and decide how many marks you think this answer is worth. Remember, it's at a maximum of five. Now, to do that, you'll need to take a read through the answer on the Word document that you see in front of you. And you'll also need to pay reference to the spreadsheet where the workings to support that answer can be found. So press pause. You can toggle backwards and forwards through this recording to look at the Word versus the spreadsheet and then come back when you're ready to see if we agree on the mark awarded. So looking at the first part, the answer, it says in the question, we need to calculate the good on the date of acquisition. I've got a lovely clear heading here to show exactly which bit of the question I am answering. It then says on the 1st of January, Carbis acquired 80% of bike light. Goodwill arose on the acquisition and it discusses how the goodwill is calculated. But none of that was required by the question. The question just wanted a calculation. It doesn't want a repetition of the question or an explanation about how the goodwill is going to be calculated. It simply wanted a working. So if we hop on over to the spreadsheet, here is the working. And it's lovely and, lovely and neatly laid out. I've got a heading working one. I've got dinars. I've got my numbers making up the goodwill. I've got some text down the left hand side to explain what those numbers are. And there I have my goodwill of 42. Being a little bit pedantic in the net asset line, that 80, there's no explanation in the formula cell as to how that 80 came about. In fact, it's the carrying amount plus the fair value. 
Now I'm lucky, I got the numbers right, but if they've made a mistake, it'd be very difficult for the marker to award part marks without something to support that calculation. So the goodwill of 42 is the goodwill arising in acquisition. However, that's in dinar and the consolidated accounts are in dollars. So that 42 needs to be translated. And you can see that in working two, the translation of 42 into dollars. Oh, there's a problem here though. I don't know if you noticed, but the exchange rate has not been applied correctly. It's been multiplied across instead of divided. So I've actually ended up with the wrong answer. So out of the one marks that was available for this, I would say that you're going to get the half a mark for coming up with the 42, but you're not going to get anything for the translation because you didn't execute it correctly. Now, what's a shame is when I go back to the Word document, I haven't actually written down the answer to the question. I haven't actually stated the goodwill at the date of acquisition is and inserted the amount. Maybe the marker will forgive you. Maybe you're working so neat that on this occasion, they'll let that slip, but it's still a careless mistake to make. Next, we were asked to calculate the goodwill at the 30th of September, the date of the disposal. So back in my workings, we're on to working two, you can see that there has been an impairment in the year of six, which has been translated into dollars, and the same mistake has been made with the translation. Now, I can't penalize you twice for the same mistake. So I'm actually going to award you half a mark for that impairment, even though it's not exactly the right number, because you have taken the impairment away from the acquisition number. That gave me the goodwill of 36 in dinars. And again, the same translation mistake has been made. But all in all, I still think I would get a mark for coming up with that retranslation of the goodwill at the end of the year, bearing in mind I can't penalize you for that translation mistake a second time. That has been transferred nicely back into the answer. So I've got the goodwill at the date disposal, 12.6 million, beautifully referenced over to my working. Perfect layout. Finally, we were asked to calculate the exchange difference on the goodwill from January to September. Now, looking at the answer, it says the exchange difference is 10.8. It doesn't say if that's an exchange gain or an exchange loss, a little bit of sloppiness there. But when we come across to the spreadsheet, there's also been some sloppiness in the calculation as well. The exchange difference has been calculated as a balancing figure, which is the right thing to do. But this exchange difference, this balancing figure is going to represent the exchange differences for all the years cumulatively from the date of acquisition to the date of disposal. Yet what the question wanted was the exchange difference just from January the 1st to the 30th of September of X6. So there was more work, pardon me, there was more work required than has actually um, been demonstrated in the answer. So I think it would be fair to say that around about mar a mark of one is probably all I could expect for the exchange difference. So adding all of this together, you can see I've awarded myself three out of five, 60%, not a bad answer at all. It's nicely laid out. I have managed to answer all three parts of the question. Um, there was an element of rushing, not reading the question carefully. And perhaps what might have helped is if my heading here had said calculation of exchange difference for the year to disposal, that might have helped focus my mind on specifically the requirement in the question. For our next question, we're going to have a look at the requirement where you're asked to explain the accounting for a scenario. And in these scenario based explanation questions, recent examiners reports have identified that the explanation itself is typically worth more marks than any associated calculations. So you really need to make sure the answer just doesn't just focus on turning out those calculations. You'll need to decide which accounting standard is relevant, and there may even be more than one standard to reference. 
For example, if you're writing about the impairment of property, plant and equipment, you might need to discuss both IS-16 on PP&E as well as IS-36 on impairment. The next point is the most important point by far. Which aspects of the standard are relevant to the scenario? The examiner doesn't want you to spout forth on the entire standard. Instead, you have to determine which particular requirements in the standard govern the accounting of the issues in this scenario. Be really careful to ensure you don't answer the question you wish had been set and you stick to the boundaries of the requirement. When trying to ensure you're keeping your answer relevant to the scenario, it really helps to use the client's name, the year end, the amounts, the details from the question. It also is helpful to you, but it shows the examiner as well that you're considering the scenario rather than just giving a generic answer. If you need to do calculations, then we discussed those back in our previous question, put them into a spreadsheet, or if you're doing on paper, put them in an appendix and cross-reference back to the written answer so your marker does know they're there. When writing your answer, there is no need for an introduction. Don't waste precious minutes repeating sentences from the scenario. Just launch straight into your first point. Keep each point brief but clear. One point per sentence is a really good guide. And whilst there's no need for perfect grammar and full sentences, the examiner generally doesn't want a list of bullet points. The marker needs to be able to understand your answer, so sparse notes they can't follow aren't going to earn you marks. Finally, adding some structure to your answer really helps. So a heading copied across from the requirement combined with subheadings for each issue will help both you and the marker to stay on track. Leave plenty of space for your answer to breathe. That also really helps the marker. And by space, I mean space gaps between headings, between paragraphs, between workings. So let's have a look now at another question from the March-June 2020 exam. This time we're looking at question four. We're back in the ACA practice platform. And you can see once again, I've pre-populated an answer to part B2 of this question four from the exam. We're gonna mark this question. And so let's have a look first of all at the requirement. Here it is on the left. Discuss how the sale of both types of inventory and the contract with a new customer should be recognized in the financial statements of ZTEC in accordance with IFRS 15. And below, I've pulled up both of the exhibits. The first one is around the types of inventory that ZTEC, the company, sells. And the second extract relates to the new customer contract. Over on the right, I have my answer. It just spills off the page. So there's the first page of the answer. And I'll just scroll down so you can see the end. As before, I'd like you to pause this recording. I'd like you to look through the question and my answer and decide how many marks out of a maximum of seven you think I would be awarded. So let's have a look at my first part of the answer. I started off by saying IFRS 15 applies a five-step model to revenue recognition. And I've repeated what the five steps are. Now, that's all perfectly valid, but does it answer the question? Unfortunately, it doesn't. And I can't expect to earn a mark if I'm not actually answering the question. So let me just pull up the requirement so I can actually allocate some marks. Having said that, I'm going to give myself, unfortunately, a big fat zero for that discussion there. Okay. I go on to say the main issue in the scenario is determining the distinct performance obligations, but I'd say there are several issues, not one issue to talk about. So really what I just need to do is get on with the question. We can see in the scenario, we have got two um, packages. In fact, it tells you a little bit more clearly in the opening part of the question, which you can't see here. The first package is called the O inventory. So I have a nice heading here for O inventory. 
And I go on to say the goods and services are capable of being distinct and are distinct in the context of the contract and therefore they should be accounted for as separate performance obligations. Well, yes, that's right. That's the, that's the final answer is right, that they should indeed be treated separately. But again, it reads as a bit of a generic answer. What goods and services? Why not talk about the fact we have hardware, we have professional services, we have hosting services? Use the specifics from the question. And why have I decided they're distinct in the context of the contract? There's no mention here of the picking up the point from the scenario that says that these items are, can be sold separately from each other and the company doesn't provide any integration. So I've kind of got a little way into the answer, but I haven't developed it well enough to score anything more than half a mark for that point. And out of interest, the marking key allocates a maximum of two marks to O inventory. So I'd say I haven't done particularly well on that bit of the question. Then we have the second contract, which is inventory X or the second package inventory X. And my answer is a little bit better. The professional services are oh, brilliant. Now I'm actually using terminology from the scenario. The professional services are treated as distinct, but the hardware and hosting, again, referencing the scenario, are a single performance um, obligation. Okay, so I like the fact that I've come up with the terminology, the fact pattern from the question. So I think that would be half a mark for picking up the professional services and half a mark for talking about the hardware and the hosting also being distinct. I've actually got the terminology from the scenario. And I also like the fact I've explained why I feel that the hardware and the hosting should be wrapped together as a single performance obligation is because they are integral to the delivery of the hosted software. But all I've done is I've picked up the exact words from the scenario and copied them into my answer. On the one hand, that's good, but I'm looking for a bit more development. I'm looking for you to explain what that actually means. Okay. I could have expanded it to say that I can't use the hardware without the hosting services and the company is providing an integration of the two together to make it usable by the customer. I then go on to say for both contracts, the transaction price should be allocated to the various distinct performance obligations and each one should be recognized. Again, it's just a generic discussion. Might get half a mark, but I think there are more important things to be talking about. So for inventory X, I've awarded myself one and a half out of a maximum of three that the marking key had for that particular aspect of the answer. Then we move on to the contract with the new customer. So here it is, sales to new region. At step one, when identifying the contract, IFRS 15 requires it to be probable that the entity will collect payment. Okay, so that's correct. It does require it to be probable and that is relevant to the scenario because it does talk about the concern about collectability due to the economic downturn. As ZTech, look, we've got the company name in there. As ZTech feels it would collect only 80% of the 3 million consideration, the collectability should be based on 2.4 million. Again, I've got the specific numbers from the question that I'm wrapping into my answer. The transaction price at step three will therefore be measured based on the amount ZTech expects to be entitled to out of that 2.4 million. So that was a really good answer, maybe one and a half out of two, maybe even slightly higher. I might have been a bit mean on myself there. It would have been good perhaps to develop that final point a little bit further by explaining the collectability assessment, referencing the words intent and ability of the customer to pay the $2.4 million. That would have then taken me to the maximum of two for that particular bit. So all in all, I've given myself 50%, three and a half out of seven. Um, I could have done a better answer by applying the scenario to, um, to the um, answer a little bit better than I did. For our final question, we'll be reviewing the discussion requirement. Now, many students omit this requirement. And for those who do attempt it, it's often one of the worst performing question types normally because people don't give it the time allocation it needs, or maybe it's on a topic where you're not very confident. Sticking to your time allocation throughout the exam is essential 
so that you can give each question a fair attempt. Be careful not to digress from the requirement set to one you wish had been set, because irrelevant points won't earn marks. Quit the long intros, the scene setters, the off-topic matters, and ensure you have read the requirement several times over, highlighting the key words so it's set in your mind. For discussion requirements in particular, it's a good idea to plan your answer. This will help to achieve clarity in your answer. Make sure you have considered each issue in the requirement because there is normally more than one issue to discuss. To ensure you get good marks, you must develop each point while staying within the requirement. A few words are unlikely to earn you any marks and neither is repetition. Try to think what link you can provide to substantiate your point. Structure your answer using subheadings where you've identified multiple issues to discuss. And finally, bullet points are not appropriate for this requirement. You must use sentences whilst keeping them short and to the point. So let's return one last time to the ACCA practice platform for our final marking exercise. This time we're visiting the December 2018 exam. Question four, part A, requirement one. You can see that I have once again pre-populated an answer and I've opened up the marking section of the practice platform. Here's the requirement on the left. We're just focusing on part one worth four marks that asks us to discuss briefly the arguments for and against issuing the IFRS practice statement management commentary as a non-binding framework rather than an IFRS standard. Four marks. So I would like you to pause the recording, read through my answer on the right, and decide how many out of four you think it is worth. I'd also like you to consider how long you thought it took me to put together this answer. Bearing in mind four marks will be roughly seven minutes. Okay, well, looking at the requirement, the first thing to notice is that word briefly. We don't want an essay. We want a short answer. Four marks, realistically looking for four points. You've been asked to talk about the fours and against. So I'm looking to balance my answer between the pros of it being a non-binding framework and the cons, the against of it being a non-binding non-binding framework rather than IFRS standard. If you look at my answer, you can see I have indeed got my um, split between advantages and disadvantages. But I actually began my answer with an introduction. Now for four marks, do you really think it's worthwhile doing an introduction? Do you really think there's gonna be marks for basically just copying from the question? Well, I think you know the answer to that, it's a no. So that precious time I spent writing that introduction has earned me no marks. Looking at my first advantage, if the practice statement were a standard, it would be impossible to specify management commentary requirements that would be suitable across so many different business models. Yeah, that's a good point. And for that, I think it'd be worth half a mark. If you look at the next point, it's longer. Now, longer is not always better, but let's have a read through. By having a practice statement, it offers a more flexible approach for management to consider the application to their business. Well, I like that. I'm getting now into the nitty gritties of the pros. And then comes my link. Because of this, it should result in the provision of insightful information on the entity's objectives and strategies rather than a mandatory tick box disclosure exercise creating boilerplate statements. Now that is elevated my answer from being half a mark up to one mark. Let's look at my third point. Management can decide what level of detail is necessary to supplement the information. So yeah, management's got that element of a discretion about how detailed to go in, how much detail to go into in order, again, here's the link, why is this helpful? To provide meaningful and relevant disclosures about the performance and prospects of the business to the user. As for disadvantages, I've got two. And already by now, hopefully you're starting to realize this answer is too long. I couldn't do that in seven minutes, not giving it the care and attention it needed. A non-mandatory practice statement creates the risk, or what risk? The risk that management commentaries may not be consistent in their content or depth between businesses. Brilliant. 
And then comes the link. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem for the user because it means they don't have any comparability between different businesses practice statement, uh, sorry, different businesses management commentary. And lastly, the regulator in a jurisdiction may not support the inclusion of a management commentary or fail to provide authority to ensure it contains good quality information. Again, half a mark, and then comes my link about what the implications are, resulting in entities not preparing the statement or delivering one that's not detailed enough to be useful. I want to give another half a mark, but you see, I'm unable because I've maxed out. I've got the four marks, and so anything else I write is simply a waste of time. So I hope this recording has been useful to you. I hope you now feel confident to repeat this exercise on your own practice questions. Thank you so much for watching this recording and good luck with the rest of your studies.